Thanks a lot for coming. Um, I'll start out by uh, first. I, I apologize in advance for um, the sort of heights of abstractness that this talk will reach at certain points. I'll try to be as clear as possible and to give examples uh, when I can. Um, I'll give a brief roadmap first. Uh, I'm going to talk about the context in which these questions arose for me uh, within Platypus. Um, then I'll talk about uh, Kant and Hegel, uh, Hegel's relationship to Kant, a little bit on the phenomenology of spirit, um, and then I'll spend most of my time on Hegel and the logic. Uh, then after I finish talking about Hegel, I'll move on to Foucault and Althusser. Interest in Marx in the academic world has been on the rise in recent years. And the idea of socialism, if not exactly Marx's socialism, is back on the mainstream political agenda in the US for the first time since Eugene Debs ran for president in the early 20th century. Marxian journals like Jacobin have received favorable coverage in the newspaper of record, the New York Times, and the youngest congresswoman in American history is a card-carrying member of the DSA who owes her current superstardom in large part to her willingness to characterize her proposed solutions to poverty and global warming as socialist. Yet this resurgent interest in Marxian ideas should be taken with a grain of salt. Those who espouse them offer withering criticisms of income inequality and the immorality of billionaires, but little in the way of explanation of the institutional forms and social conditions that systematically produce inequality in billionaires. So, what exactly? Sure. Okay. Yeah. So, what exactly does it mean to be a Marxist, or more broadly, what does it mean to provide a critical theory? What does Marxism or critical theory commit us to, and what sorts of commitments does it rule out? What would it mean to provide a truly adequate critique of modernity, of the capitalist form of social life? So as I said, this question of what would count as an adequate critique, this, this arose in uh, the context of this, the internal discussions in Platypus um, about the relationship between philosophy and Marxism. So Platypus is an international Marxist political project founded in 2006 in response to the anti-war movement during the Bush years. Platypus is an attempt to clarify divergent tendencies on the left, and it's characterized by a refusal to take the idea of the left for granted. It's not an activist project, but a project of self-education. It tries to come to grips with the class of the proletarian movement of socialism and the emergence of the new left. It adopts Marx's principle of the ruthless critique of everything existing and refuses to assume that what calls itself the left today actually is the left. It seeks to retain the memory of the revolutionary left, grounded in an account of both the failure and the promise of capitalist bourgeois society. The question this raises, at least for me, is what would count as an adequate form of leftism? What would count as an adequate form of critical theory? How do we distinguish between the mere pretension to emancipation and actual emancipation? What is a critique? What would an account of the possibility of a critical, critical account look like? These are irreducibly philosophical questions. Marxism presupposes an account of how reality ought to be understood. In taking issue with, say, Foucaultian discourse analysis or Althusserian anti-humanism, it is not just rejecting such accounts as late capitalist symptoms, but it is telling us that they get things wrong, that they fail to account for how things actually are. Not in the sense that there is an independent criterion against which all such accounts can be measured, but in the sense that the accounts are incoherent. They cannot explain what they purport to explain. Marxism must have metaphysical, metaphysical commitments. The claim that all knowledge and practice is historical, the claim that society has an intelligible structure, the claim that history itself is a certain form. 
Justifying such commitments requires a distinctly philosophical account of critical theory. It requires a return to the most ambitious attempt to provide such an account, Hegel's logic and the theory of method that includes it. Distinction between, uh, the distinction between philosophy and critical theory is something I'm going to focus on throughout this. I'm going to focus in the present context on first, the philosophical foundation of critical theory, and second, on what I take to be two failed attempts to articulate critical theories, Foucault's genealogy and Althusser's aleatory materialism. So, German idealism. It might seem like an odd claim that Hegel is offering a critical theory or a justification of it. But the logic is meant to accomplish just such a justification in relation to Hegel's reality. Hegel's philosophy of right is a proto form of the critical theory of bourgeois society. Okay. Philosophy is best thought of as an ongoing debate over how we ought to understand ourselves. The German idealist tradition makes this explicit, arguing for the first time that philosophy isn't a matter of anthropological description, disinterested contemplation of an objective good, divine intuition, or utilitarian calculus. The idealists show that what has always been implicitly, what has always been implicitly an issue in philosophy is who we are and how we ought to understand what it means to be the kind of being that can understand, period. Such an inquiry into what it means to understand is ultimately an inquiry into what it means to be free. Self-consciousness, reason, and freedom are one. This matters for Marxism because Marxism is a set of claims about how we ought to understand ourselves and the world. Marxism is philosophy and more than philosophy at once. Kant's famous Copernican turn lay in his revolutionary claim that our concepts do not conform to the world, rather that the world must conform to our concepts. Against the empiricists, Kant argued that we dictate the form of nature, giving it its laws. Against the rationalists, our categories of understanding must be relativized to our species-specific form of sensibility, space and time. Simply put, Kant argues that all experience is self-conscious experience, that all perception is apperceptive. The apperceptive character of experience is a matter of judgment for Kant, which is the basic unit of thought. Concepts are not representational primitives or abstractions, but predicates of possible, possible judgments that function as rules for judgment. At the highest level of generality, such concepts are, refer are referred to as pure concepts, or categories, which make the experience of determining objects possible. That is, Kant's theory of concepts is meant to account for the possibility of experiential content, of how anything can be picked out and distinguished from anything else. As rules for judging, categories like substance and causality are required for understanding anything as anything, for taking anything to be the case. Such rules establish what ought to be judged and how experience ought to be unified. Accordingly, they are not psychological rules of thought or descriptions of regularities, but norms. Normative proprieties to which we are self-consciously responsive in any possible experience. So what it means to say that these are not psychological rules for Kant, Kant famously says that the conditions for the possibility of experience are the conditions for the possibility of the objects of experience, which is to say that uh, the normative proprieties that, that uh, govern judgment are what make objects themselves possible. They're supposed to tell us how things are, not just how we think that they are. Even though this table will argue, you know, this is sort of a slight of hand because Kant ultimately has to deny, deny the claim that he wants to make. <clears throat> To say that experience is apperceptive is thus to say that in perceiving a thing, I am aware that it ought to be perceived in some way rather than another. Ultimately, what it means to be self-conscious and free 
It's to always be asking the question of what ought to be done and what ought to be believed. Okay, so Hegel's critique comes. Hegel criticizes what he takes to be Kant's transcendental skepticism, claiming that Kant takes back with one hand what he gives with another. This is the famous uh, thing in itself, skepticism, that Kant's meaning is the transcendental apparatus uh, voiding it of its claim to knowledge. Hegel rejects Kant's deductive method as questioning. He rejects the view that the mind is an instrument that can be grasped by its experience. The examination of conditions of knowing is already part of the process of knowing. Hegel famously quips that we can't learn to swim by our in the water. Hegel objects to Kant's two-step picture of knowledge as deriving from the forms of intuition, on the one hand, and from the categories of the understanding, on the other. Hegel claims that first, Kant really assumes space and time as the empirical features of specific human experience, and he merely, merely assumes the categories on empirical grounds, instead of deriving from the structure of pure thinking. And this is what Hegel thought one of the great achievements of Fichte was, that Fichte already dropped this out by trying to establish that the categories themselves can't just be assumed, they can't just be asserted in the table of categories, which is whether this is fair or not to Kant. This is what Fichte and Hegel accused Kant of doing in the first critique. What they want to say is you have to be able to derive the categories from thought itself. The categories have to be derived from one another, and they have to be able to be inferred from one another. We have to show that, uh, that thought itself makes these categorical demands of itself. And that's what Hegel wants to demonstrate in logic. So Hegel, by contrast, shows that categories aren't empty, but are themselves contentful. There's a famous claim that uh, was mentioned earlier that when Kant says that uh, intuitions without concepts um, are blind, concepts without intuitions are empty. And Hegel wants to reject this by saying that um, when we talk about substance and causality, these pure categories, uh, but they're not just applied to experience, but they're already contentful. They already have content. They already tell us something about what must be true of objectivity. So it's not as if we need you know, some vehicle for an external content that the categories can then process in the sort of two-step picture that Kant is proposing. What Hegel wants to say is we should just eliminate the idea that space and time are species-specific forms of sensibility. We should just eliminate space and time or the idea of intuition from this picture. And instead, what we need to ask uh, is what thought requires itself and what the categories themselves tell us about possible objects. The categories themselves are the conditions for the determinacy of any possible content. So another way to put this issue is um, Kant makes a distinction between a transcendental and a metaphysical deduction, where in Kant, a transcendental deduction uh, is supposed to demonstrate the applicability of the categories of understanding to our pure forms of intuition. So this is part of Kant's critique of rationalism, that he wants to show that uh, pure categories of thought have to be relativized to our sensible capacities for experience, that they have to be given this sort of experiential content, this, this sensible content. And that's what a transcendental deduction is supposed to accomplish, that the pure forms of intuition are susceptible to that application, that categorical application. A metaphysical deduction, which Fichte and, Kant, Fichte and Hegel claim that Kant doesn't actually provide, is supposed to be a deduction of the categories on their own. It's supposed to just show, uh, it's supposed to vindicate our entitlement to using such categories. Just by virtue of giving account of the categories themselves. It's supposed to demonstrate their inner necessity. Hegel thinks that we can get rid of the idea of a transcendental deduction. All we need is a metaphysical deduction. That that already accomplishes what Kant wants to do. Uh, and that's to say that 
we don't need a separate notion of what these intuitions are, because if we get the categories right, they themselves will just tell us what any possible intuition could be. So, uh, yeah, it's important to, to qualify this slightly, this is sounding like Hegel is just rejecting Kant, but what Hegel is actually doing is radicalizing Kant. Uh, he accepts Kant's emphasis on the economy of thought, and he actually wants to push Kant to be the best self, the best philosophical self, and to make Kant everything that he could be. <clears throat> Hegel ties the Kantian problem of determinate experiential content to the historical problem of what it would mean to lead a genuinely free life. Getting the world right, in other words, will require that we get ourselves right. This is the, the Hegelian plan. This is the headline of phenomenology spirit. The phenomenology is a demonstration of the practical impossibility of denying the identity of subject and object were the role played by apperceptive spontaneity in rendering objectivity intelligible. Hegel shows that the specification of determinate content is ultimately dependent on a social and historical project of progressively realizing human freedom. For Hegel, Kant has successfully shown that any experience of objects must be self-conscious. To give a lecture, I must take myself to be given a lecture. But taking for Kant is not observational or contemplative but it's rather normative and provisional. In giving a lecture, I do so in light of the norms that govern how lectures ought to be given. It is because I am not simply observing myself, but I am rather trying to act in accord with the norm that I, that I can always fail to do what the norm requires. Whether or not I am who I take myself to be is not simply up to me, accordingly, but depends on whether or not I am recognized by other institutional participants as having succeeded. This is the Hegelian claim about mutual recognition. And part of the point that Hegel is making uh, in chapter four of the phenomenology, when we get the famous master slave biology, is that the question is open the phenomenology about sense certainty, perception, understanding. Hegel wants to show that the only way to actually overcome the antinomies and the contradictions that those positions give, give rise to uh, is if we show that uh, experience of content is ultimately a matter of the norms to which we hold ourselves and one another. <coughs> Try to get some more, flesh that claim out a bit more <coughs> over the course of this. This raises a larger historical question of which institutional conditions would enable us to actually be who we take ourselves to be, for us to genuinely share our reasons for acting. The much vaunted absolute knowing at the end of the phenomenology is nothing more than the recognition of the dependence of the object for its intelligibility on the social and historical process of collective self-constitution, of trying to be who we ourselves to be. In recognizing that we are the source of the authority of our norms, that is to say, nature doesn't give us, nature doesn't have authority over our norms, Divinity doesn't have authority over norms. We are the only ones that can give norms authority over what we can and over what we do. In recognizing that we are the source of the authority of our norms, we also recognize that, quote, substance is also in truth subject, or that what it means for an object to be an object is for it to be taken as one by us. This does not dissolve nature and subject or result in the devouring of objectivity by subjectivity, but accounts for the real, the very intelligibility of the externality and existential independence of objects. So one way to flesh this point out is that Hegel's relying on a distinction between uh, sense dependence and reference dependence, which is to say that objects don't depend on us for their existence, but they depend on us for their intelligibility. So, this raises the question of the thought of thought, of what it means to understand anything as anything. The phenomenology may show that the experience of objects depends on thought, that the object is even identical with the subject, in the sense that the notion of an intelligible object just is what we subjects collectively take it to be, 
But the phenomenology has not yet specified the nature of such identity. It hasn't told us that what thought is. It hasn't demonstrated the inner structure of thought. So now I'm going to talk about the logic, and here I really apologize. Uh, what the logic purports to demonstrate is one, what must be true of objects for them to intelligibly be objects, and two, what must be true of subjects for both subjectivity and objectivity to intelligibly be what they are. The logic is the logical unfolding of the inner structure of Kant's notion of apperceptive thought. For Hegel, Kant has successfully shown that any experience of objects must be self-conscious. The logic is an attempt to think about what it means to think, what it means to think the thought of anything. Given the general apperceptive requirement to specify, thought thinking itself is an attempt to think the thought of thought in light of the norm that governs thinking. That governs, thought, that governs how thought ought to be thought. What would it mean to think thought rightly? To think thought as it ought to be thought. And this question, I'll talk about it in, in a moment, but this is the same question as uh, for Hegel. Uh, what would it mean to think being as being ought to be thought? What must be true of being for being to intelligibly be being? What would a coherent account of being be? What would a coherent account of thought be? Hegel's ambition is to show that to think thought rightly is to think of thought as the thought of an object. If we render intelligible thinking, we have just thereby shown what can count not only as an object of thought, but as an object, period. So roughly, we first need a coherent account of the structure of objectivity. And this corresponds to the first two books of the logic, uh, the logic of being, the logic of essence. But a coherent account of objectivity ultimately depends on and requires a coherent account of subjectivity, which renders objects intelligible in light of its own self-legislated norms. These norms, and this is Hegel's theory of the idea, the logic is an account of the absolute idea. And the absolute idea is basically uh, Hegel's concept of the concept. He's giving an account of uh, it's, it's a theory of conceptuality. He's trying to explain uh, what it means for a concept to be a norm. That's how I would interpret it. These norms are within sensitive standards in light of which anything can be what it is or can fail to be. For example, spirit is always trying to successfully be spirit. Ancient and feudal social norms fail as social norms, requiring a transformation of spirit. Likewise, in giving a lecture, I am trying to give a lecture as it ought to be given. I am not trying to give a bad lecture. If I try to give a bad lecture, then the badness of the lecture has become my new criteria of success. I'm engaged in a different enterprise in that case. While the norms themselves are historically specific, that the spirit has such a normative structure is a metaphysical, logical condition. The very first thought of the logic, the thought of pure being, is a fairly straightforward illustration of the apperceptive quality of logic. In trying to think of thought as the thought of pure being, we must ask how it is that pure being ought to be thought. As Hegel famously argues, the thought of pure being is indeterminate because it gives us no way to specify any particular content or what being itself would be. Such discrimination would require a form of negation that a pure being is about us. We would need to be able to say that in being X, X is not Y, and vice versa. The permanent assumptions that underlie pure being commit us to the further thought that pure being is nothing, that the thought of pure being is a failed or incoherent thought, because not a determinate thought at all. Applied to thought itself, apperceptive judgment takes us from the empty thought of pure being to the insufficiency of quantity and quality as a determinate specification of subjective content, to essence and appearance as the distinction essential to grounding the thought of being, to the idea of living, rational agents as the source of the normative authority of any determinate specification of objective content. 
The answer to that idea, with which the logic concludes, articulates the theory of conceptuality. Grasping the concept as the formal activity of trying to be a subject, of trying to lead a life in light of noise. The idea of grasp the concepts are not abstractions, but the norms constitutive of objects that are trying to be subjects. So Hegel wants to demonstrate that out of the very notion of pure being, we can develop into and reduce the idea that the only way to give a coherent account of pure being is in terms of uh, self, historically self legislating subjects. He wants to say that, that the notion of thinking subjectivity is essential to providing a coherent account of being. <coughs> So, any notion of being will be a concept of being. We cannot get outside of or appeal to a notion of being that would exceed the bounds of sense without just saying nonsense. Okay, now on to the critical theory part of the talk. Now, the Hegelian idea, which I'll talk more about in tomorrow's lecture for those who are coming, uh, claims to render intelligible the possibility of rendering anything intelligible. What Hegel's logic of freedom or of subjectivity gives us in the realm of philosophy is the method for measuring critical theories against themselves, against their own critical tensions. In other words, Hegel gives us an account of how to give a truly satisfying account of society, a self-determining object whose principle of intelligibility or explanation lies within itself. And yeah, and one obvious objection would be that, well, you know, according to Marx, Hegel didn't give you know, the best account of society that he could be given. But the, the point that I'm making is that that notwithstanding, uh, Hegel, Hegel's arguments in the logic don't depend on anything that he has to say in the philosophy of right. They don't depend on anything that he has to say in the real philosophy. What Hegel produces is the notion of constitutive standard. The standard in light of which subjects and institutions can succeed or fail at being what they are trying to be. This understanding of German idealism as fundamentally about the normative authority of rationality, conceptual determinacy, and the objective purport of thought is radically different from the character, caricature that figures like Althusser and Foucault are known to present. But while the case of the name of the grounds that they severely misread Hegel, I want to gesture towards a different line of criticism, a philosophical line of criticism, which will claim that their theories are incoherent. I want to address the code's genealogical method and also say theory of materialism. So I'll start with the code. And these are sort of sketches, so I apologize if they're a little bit crude. The task of genealogy for Foucault is to show that our forms of practice and forms of knowledge are historical results. And that as such, they can be overcome. Foucault is emphatic that this is not a normative enterprise, that he is not writing a history from the standpoint of the present, from the standpoint of contemporary values and norms, but rather a history of the present, of the historical processes and dynamics that led to its emergence. In contradistinction to his earlier archaeological method, like an order of things, which Foucault tasked with the demonstration of the contingency of past discursive formations. Genealogy is supposed to carry a sense of immediacy and urgency, exposing the historical bounds of our institutional present and the status of forms of knowledge as forms of power. So, in articulating a history of the present, Foucault is emphatically not providing a history from the standpoint of the present. Foucault rejects the historical method that judges the past from the standpoint of our values, or that attempts to demonstrate how our present was already contained in or anticipated by the past. Accordingly, Foucault rejects the Hegelian idea that history has a proposed form. The much criticized theological notion of history. Foucault's materialism <coughs> thus consists in his belief that what we do has primacy over what we take ourselves to be doing and the reasons we give for doing it. Foucault takes ideologies to be rationalizations rather than genuine reasons. 
As Foucault writes, quote, in a sense, only a single drama is ever staged in history. The endlessly repeated play of dominations. The domination of certain men over others leads to the differentiation of values. Class domination generates the idea of liberty and the forceful appropriation of things necessary for survival and the imposition of a duration not intended to <coughs> account for the origin of logic. On the Rose model, the reasons we give for the practices we sustain are strategic rationalizations for relations to power. Foucault is not consequently undertaking an analysis of the development of reason, but of historically specific forms of rationality. He goes on, quote, Humanity does not gradually progress from combat to combat until it arrives at universal reciprocity, where the rule of law finally replaces warfare. Humanity solves each of its violences in a system of rules and must proceed from domination to domination. Unquote. All forms of life are forms of domination for Foucault. There is no progress in history, but the same is affected by the persistence of power. But one would want to ask how could have specified domination as domination, as distinct from non-domination, and more importantly, what is meant in Foucault by the idea of a system of rules. Understanding what Foucault means by rules is one of the key tasks for any honest attempt to determine what counts as a genuine critical theory. Inspired by a basic and Kantian picture, Foucault argues that each historical form of life is governed by such a system of rules what scholar Amy Allen has recently called the historical version of the Kantian a priori. Such rules constitute different discourses in the forms of power. For instance, in Foucault's account of discipline and discipline and punish, the technique of normalization, this is one of the key ideas in the third section of the book, is held to engender the very idea of the institution, constituting the modern disciplines of medicine, education, and labor, among other social practices. On the Foucaultian model, modern discipline illuminates all institutions in the image of prison, establishing the continuity between older direct forms of domination and apparently more humane, indirect, contemporary forms. Normalization habituates the bodies of individuals to institutional forms, constituting them as subjects and objects of relations and power. The normative form of modern power is characterized by the positive, productive, and enabling dimension of social constraints. Unlike laws, according to Foucault, norms do not just inhibit or say no, but offer a positive standard subjects strive to meet. The student trained to do well on tests, the soldier trained to do well in combat, and so forth. Nevertheless, Foucault explicitly and adamantly denies that such norms can be understood in terms of ideas, models of self-legislation, of a subject defining itself to norms. Foucault notes that discipline produces the soul of the subject, and in a famous image, writes that the soul functions as the prison of the body. Foucault's critical claim is that such normalization should be resisted. As he writes in the text, quote, the main objective of these struggles is to attack not so much such and such an institution of power, or group, or elite, or class, but rather a technique, a form of power. But Foucault's sole critical resource in his argument for resistance to discipline and normalization is the idea that status is a contingent form of historical power. But the contingency of discipline does not give us any reason for rejecting it. Foucault must be able to answer the question as to why discipline ought to be opposed or resisted, and he must be able to tell us what ought to replace the technique of normalization that defines modern power. So first, Foucault's notion of systems rules rests on a faithful misreading of Kant. As I've argued, for Kant, rules are not external dictates, law-like principles governing behavioral regularities, or the position that discourse occupies in a structure. Rather, rules such as Kant understands them are the rules which we hold ourselves in thinking any thought or in trying to do anything. They are what make determining and intentional Kant impossible in the first place. Because Foucault fails to consider these conditions for the intelligibility of both practices and beliefs, he is unable to specify what modern society is in its determinacy, such that it could succeed or fail, and ultimately, such that it could constitute an object of critique. Foucault's implicit claim is that we ought not be a disciplinary society. 
committing him to some form of conception of who we ought to be. In light of which, a disciplinary society could be regarded as a collective failure, something that we ought not be. The demonstration of the contingency of discipline as a historical form of institutionality, consequently, is not sufficient to account for discipline as such an object of critique. The co must be able to specify what it is about discipline that counts as a collective failure, which will rule out some practices and rule in others. The issue is not just that a disciplinary society cannot be what it is trying to be, but the very notion of a disciplinary society is too abstract and indeterminate. Discipline is the end grasp of the modern condition of alienation, of our failure to see ourselves in the norms which we have found ourselves. Because we fail to grasp its own lines in the conception of normativity, he both misunderstands and yet hopes to overcome. So in conclusion, uh, I'll just further specify uh, the two ways that take the code fail to offer a compelling legal theory. First, a determinate account of the deficiencies of distinctly modern institutions will require a theory of the standard of success internal to such institutions. This is the point of Hegel's demonstration in the logic. To grasp the historical society as a historical society is to ask what it is trying to do, who its members take themselves to be. Marx's critical theory of capitalism in Earth is a theory of the form of life we share in this egalitarian sense. Second, more generally, the genealogical method for co employees cannot explain what it is trying to explain. It underdetermines what it means to be a spiritual being and what it means to lead a social and historical life as one on many. The co takes the possibility of its own account for granted, as well as the possibility of determining social content. The co thinks that acceptance of Hegel's account of history commits us to a deluded belief in the rational unfolding of history and a telos at which we will necessarily arrive. But Foucault's distorted understanding of Kant on rule following also led to its fatal misunderstanding of Hegel on history. Hegel's logical account of what it means, what it means to be a free being is an account of normative rather than metaphysical historical necessity. And I'll say more about that in uh, my discussion of what said. <clears throat> okay. So much for Foucault. Unlike Foucault, all to share does it in the ground its own capacity for providing a critique in the contradictory structure of the capitalist form of life itself. Moreover, all to share makes explicit the, philosoph the philosophical stakes of critical theory, underscoring that materialism is not a form of empirical inquiry or inductive reasoning, but rather a metaphysics. What distinguishes all is the degree to which he owns up to the philosophical foundations of his own critical past. I'll briefly trace Althusser's classic reformulation of the task of critical theory, and then proceed to outline some of the major underlying philosophical claims, as articulated in the late, the underground current of the materialism of the encounter, known as his final piece of writing. The 1962 text, Contradiction and Overdetermination, contains some of the best statements in all of Althusser of his basic approach to critical theory. Althusser famously argues that Marx's dialectical method is not an inversion of Hegel's, and that strictly speaking, such an, an inversion is the duty of achievement for Rock. This is the claim that if Hegel is articulating a metaphysics of spirit and of the idea, that this is anthropologized in Forbach, and you get a metaphysics of, uh, of humanity, you get a philosophical anthropology uh, and a humanist metaphysics. Marx, according to Althusser, and by contrast, accomplishes a critical transformation of the dialectical method, which consists in a renovation of its, quote, characteristic determinations and structures, unquote, as Althusser puts it. Above all, this means that Marx transforms the notion of contradiction itself. Drawing heavily on Mao's 1937 text on contradiction, Althusser proceeds to develop a non hegelian meaning of Marx's notion of contradiction. In other words, Althusser opposes the Hegelian idea of the future and interior, as he calls it, the notion of a monolithic contradiction that necessarily produces a future form of life out of a present form of life, the properly Marxian idea of an overdetermined contradiction. <clears throat> 
That is, for all to share, there is no single overarching contradiction at the heart of the historical form of life. Rather, contradiction is overdetermined over in the sense that there is always a multiplicity of contradictions, which are both superstructural and infrastructural in nature. It is when such contradictions accumulate that they produce a ruptural unity, which Althusser defines as, quote, the result of the immense majority of the popular masses grouped in an, in an assault on a regime which its ruling classes are unable to defend. Althusser famously remarks that the economy or mode of production is determinant in the last census. Turning to the example of the German SPD, the Social Democratic Party in the 1910s, Althusser argues that the mistake of the party was to believe in such a monolithic contradiction between labor and capital, which would of necessity drive the historical process of the overcoming of capitalism. Their failure, according to Althusser, lay in their ignorance of the multiplicity of actual and empirical contradictions playing out in reality. Because they were not attuned to the specificity of their situation, they succumbed to fatalism, to Hegelian teleology. As Althusser goes on to point out, the, the economy is never truly determined in the last instance, because of the reported last instance, one one when the multiplicity of contradictions converge into one pure contradiction between labor and capital, it never arrives. From the first moment to the last, Althusser tells us, the lonely hour of the last instance never comes. For Althusser, this theory of overdetermination grasps the fundamentally contingent nature of the political process. It grasps how revolution can fail to come to pass, and how the revolutionary process develops unevenly, not all in one go. In 1982, in one of Althusser's final pieces of writing, he articulates the metaphysical principles that underlie his earlier anti-Galeanism. He claims to have discovered an alternative materialist tradition in the history of philosophy, the so-called materialism of the encounter. The main players in this tra tradition are an eclectic bunch, Epicurus, Spinoza, Machiavelli, Hobbes, Rousseau, Marx, Heidegger, Derrida, and Althusser itself. The key idea of Althusser's account is derived from Lucretius's notion of the swerve of atoms. No, this is a lengthy quote, but it's, uh, it's a good description of what he means. Before the formation of the world, an infinity of atoms were falling in parallel to each other in the void. Then the climate supervenes. The climate is an infinitesimal swerve. No one knows where or when or how it occurs or what causes an atom to swerve from its vertical fall in the void. And breaking the parallelism in an almost negligible way at one point induced an encounter with the atom next to it. And from encounter to encounter, a pile in the birth of the world. That is to say, of the agglomeration of atoms induced in the chain reaction by the initial swerve and encounter. For Althusser, the Lucretian swerve is prior to all, all causality and rationality, and is the basis for all intelligible encounters or causal rational relations between elements that must sw first swerve into one another. As he writes, quote, once men are forced to make encounters and found associations, which in fact lacks, constrained relationships spring up among them, social relationships that are rudimentary at first and are then reinforced by the effects that these encounters have on their human nature." Unquote. It is clear that the swerve underlies, or at least can ground retrospectively, Althusser's notion of overdetermination. One can see that the accumulation of contradictions is the cause of the attention affected encounter. This idea of dependency is meant to secure, against Hegel, the thought that the encounter might not have taken place. And this is the key notion in both of these essays in many respects, is that Althusser wants to be able to say that you know, something cannot happen, that the revolution cannot take place, that there isn't, uh, that there isn't a causal necessity to the dynamic of history. <clears throat> the notion of contingency Althusser employs is not a pure fact, as he contends. This is something else that he says, but uh, in turning to the notion of contingency, uh, that he's observing something factual about the world. The notion of contingency Althusser employs is not a pure fact, but a thought determination, 
the category of intelligibility. Althusser's claiming that reality ought to be understood as exhausted in its intelligibility by the category of contingency. Yet Hegel, in the logic of essence, not only establishes the necessity of contingency as the determination of intelligible being under the rubric of absolute necessity, but he also establishes the insufficiency of the category of contingency for accounting for the proposed structure of living organisms and artifacts for the proposed form of actions and social practices. For example, the contingent causes that have insulated in my previous lecture, my birth, my entrance in college, my chance encounter with the organizer of this event years ago, cannot themselves account for the content of the practice of lecture giving. A different order of intelligibility is required. No causal explanation can tell us what it means to succeed or fail at a given lecture. No causal explanation can tell us what reasons we take to count or what reasons we take it that we need to give uh, in giving a lecture. What counts as a good lecture versus a bad lecture, so forth. These are normative, first personal requirements that we make for ourselves. While Altusser acknowledges that the atomic swerve produces a lasting encounter, which then becomes the basis for all reality, all necessity, all meaning, and all reason, he fails to see that such necessity, meaning, and reason themselves require a philosophical account and cannot simply be taken for granted. Altusser is only given us half an explanation, and thus he sorts the reality he is trying to explain. This raises serious questions about the adequacy of Althusser's theory of overdetermination as a critical theory of capitalist society. At issue is not just the fact of the multiplicity of contradictions, but what it means for a practice or an institution to contradict itself, to be what it fails to be what it is trying to be by its own lights. Such failure can matter in the first place, can matter politically, because we are not being who we take ourselves to be. To identify a practical contradiction as a contradiction is to make a normative claim about an institutional deficiency and about what that institution ought to be. The point is not to ground everything in one abstract overarching contradiction that will resolve itself out of metaphysical necessity, but to grasp the reasons we are giving one another as to why we are sustaining the practices that we are and why we take some what we take some practices to entail and exclude. One politically relevant contradiction between the democratic tensions of mass culture and its stultifying ideological effects, for example, will show up as a contradiction for the same socially shared reasons that any number of others will. This requires an account of the form of life we share and of what we would count as practical success together. To pay off the earlier promissory note, the form of historical necessity defended by Hegel is a rational or normative necessity. Only this form of necessity can actually make good on the notion of contingency argued for by Althusser in the materialism of the encounter. That is, if the key critical idea for Althusser is that there can be no guarantee of change or success, that failure is always possible, then only the Hegelian idea of rational necessity can satisfy Althusser's own purported in the hands of the demands. Norms for Hegel dictate what we must do to be who we are committed to being, but such necessity is rational rather than causal. It is because norms only prescribe what ought to happen and not what will happen that we can fail to be who we take ourselves to be, who we believe we ought to be, and can be mistaken about what we are about, what it is we take matter. Finally, all two stairs narrative to this alternative materialist tradition is not chronological in nature, but logically conceptual. He's attempting to make a case for the distinct contributions made by each of the materialists he discusses. But it is worth noting that Althusser has increased his account of the primacy of contingency, Heidegger's account of the originary nothing, Machiavelli's account of the anonymous prince. Althusser takes all of these accounts as true, and thus his accounts is often endorsed by everyone. Althusser's alienatory materialism purports to be a philosophical account of reality itself. It is an account of the absolute, in the Kantian Hegelian sense, an account of what ought to be taken as unconditionally true. But Althusser has failed to account for the possibility of meaning and truth. He has failed to account for how his own philosophical account is possible. The idea that everything is contingent cannot account for the content 
cost of the contingency of everything, which would require a reduction of the sort Hegel provides in the logic, or so I would want to claim. Althusser is asking us to hold ourselves to the idea that we are essentially determined by the atomic swerve, but he has not yet asked what it means to hold oneself to a norm, to believe what one ought to believe, to do what one ought to do. For Hegel, philosophy is a matter of a resolution, a commitment, because we must hold ourselves accountable for our own being. And that requires understanding any possible metaphysics, such as the materialism of the encounter, as a logic, an account of your thinking. Logic is the practice not of justifying the ways of God to man, but of justifying the ways of thinking to thought itself. It is thus a logic of freedom, not only in the sense that it articulates the logic of what it means to be free, but also in the sense that it is a fully free practice of logic, leaving no presupposition uncontested and demanding the thought that it learns to think for itself. It is for this reason that the Hegelian resolve to consider thinking as such culminates in the free release of the idea, the endlossing of the idea. And committing ourselves to thinking of thought as it ought to be thought, we become entitled to the interrogation and critique of all regions of thought, from the natural sciences to political economy, in the light of the logic of freedom. The free release of the idea of the end of the logic is nothing less than the demand that we ask whether our historical form of thought, the reason we give for what we believe and what we do, is actually thought. Does it live up to what thought ought to be? In the words of Abel's greatest student, the science of logic, that most rarefied and idealist of all the idealist texts, itself articulates the demand not only that philosophy become worldly, but also that the world be made philosophical. Thank you. part of the lecture before. Yeah. Like I found it difficult to connect the, the, the Hegel's criticism of Kant to the second part, which is the criticism of Federer's point on it. I guess like I have a few comments. One is like when you speak about historical necessity, right? And like particularly the value of materialism materialism one can conceive of necessity and it seems to be several ways. One is there's the necessity of one is like there is the necessity of like we need something, right? That something is necessary in the sense of fundamentally desirable, like we need socialism. And then there's the sense of the historical necessity of an event, right? So in terms of like the aleatory materialism, again, my thought goes to the actual development of natural science, where you have two types of of intervention of probabilistic thinking. One of which is subjective, for example, in thermodynamics, where the bodies of where you can't predict something because it's too complicated, but something is seen as ultimately determinate, though for us it's subjectively we treat it as probabilistically. But then there is also, at least in certain interpretations of quantum mechanics, an objective indeterminacy that is attributed to nature itself. That that it's not our interpretation, but somehow nature itself just acts spontaneously, whatever that means. And I guess the, the, the final question is, it seems to me that I have always felt that in both like a Hegelian teleology, that the Hegelian sense of history having meaning, that the origin of the sense of history having meaning, like other ideas that have become secular, like the idea of natural law, comes from theology. It comes from like piety shift comes from the idea of a narrative of salvation. Yeah. Just as, for example, the notion of natural law comes from a god as sovereign. Yeah. Right? So I often think like well, okay, there is in that like like your narrative and it, and I guess like the other narrative I wanted to ask was you speak of us, right? And several times us giving ourselves more. So I kept wondering, okay, who is the us? Is us worth us worth plus subject? Is us human beings? Is us any intelligent conscious entity? Who, who, right? You know, 
Okay. Yes. Uh, okay, so there are basically three questions there. The first question, um, uh, so the first thing I would say is that the sorts of um, causal explanations that you're referring to that would be appropriate to physics or the natural sciences, um, that that's a different order of explanation for Hegel. That's not the order of explanation that's appropriate to historical processes. So you made a distinction between uh, human beings and free will. Uh, free will is not really. Um, it's not appropriate because. Well, the uh, analogy there was not with Hegel. I understand that. Yeah. The analogy there was with Althusser, right? Yeah, but oh, okay. This is this is no. This is the way that this is the way that I, I, I think. Hegel, yeah, but I would say that. Althusser is taking that physical order of explanation to be a spiritual form of explanation. And that's what Hegel would reject. That's what he rejects in Schelling, for instance, when Schelling asserts the identity of you know, nature and spirit. Hegel says that you know, Schelling conflates these. I think Althusser does something similar. Because even though you know, Althusser wants to talk about how uh, you know, what follows from the swerve is an order of meaning and rationality. He still takes, you know, uh, contingency to be the, the fundamental level of explanation for history. And what Hegel would say to that is, well, you haven't told me what you mean when you say that there are orders of meaning and rationality, and what the content of meaning and rationality is. What renders that intelligible? And what Hegel wants to say, when you made the initial distinction between you know, necessity in the sense of what we need and necessity in the sense of you know, efficient causes, basically, uh, you know, Hegel would sort of say that you know, neither of those is quite the form of necessity that he's describing, unless by need we're already understanding need in terms of norms, in terms of what we require of ourselves. And what Hegel's point is is that uh, I mean, in one sense, this is sort of a crude picture, but he's taking the Kantian notion of, you know, a practical orientation in light of the categorical imperative, in light of the notion that, you know, we're free because we know that there's something that we ought to do. And in knowing that there's something that we ought to do, uh, we can thereby fail to do it. Hegel takes that to be the basic form of human freedom. And that's a self-conscious, apperceptive relation that we're always in. And whatever you're doing. We now, as a modern version of subject, we as human beings. No, no. We, we, I mean, there are. Any human beings from the beginning. Any rational agent. So this any is. Any rational agent. This isn't an anthropological thing about human beings, it's about any possible rational agent. And, you know, in this sort of, with respect to your third question about, uh, yeah, who the we is referring to, I mean, this is part of the point in, in you know, Hegel saying in the master slave dialectic that that's giving an account of the first, you know, for a social institution, that in a way it's a form of mutual recognition. You know, the whole point is that the that the slave is reconciled to the practice in an immediate sense. That, that the slave is willing to accept the master's reasons for acting. So there is a shared form of subjectivity there, even if the subjectivity of the slave is being denied. That's what makes it a contradictory situation. So the we is the ongoing, you know, uh, form of contestation in which we're trying to decide who ought to be counted among the we. But the point is, is that we all should be counted among the we. That's what generates the contradiction in the first place. That, for Hegel, is the source of you know, the dynamic of history. Right. Go ahead. Go ahead. Or could not be aware of 
this um, of this de development of uh, an interpretation that came after the death. Well, most of it. Uh, <laughs> uh, so it's, it's a small problem. Uh, in a way, what you said to us is not they didn't know what Hegel said because they couldn't know that interpretation you are uh, uh, really uh, 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 sharing with us. Uh, but uh, in a way, you said to us they need no a normative uh, framework and they don't have one. Sort of, yeah. If yeah. you ask me what is this framework, I can give you a Hegel uh, 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 version of it. For example, I would say I would reconstruct it in, in my in my head in, in this way. Yeah. So, <laughs> but it's not a problem. Uh, uh, sure, sorry, sure. It's yeah. just a historical problem, but not a logical problem. Okay. On the other hand, I have a feeling that their problem of Foucault and Althusser and many others in that time was how norms come to exist, how we can come up from social situation of uh, a pragmatic way, one of, of, of a conflict, things like that. Yeah. And it was, I think, the way they were reading the post chapter of the phenomenology. How you you begin with something that is just a conflict. They just want to, to be recognized, okay, but they are uh, ready to kill each other for yeah. that. <laughs> and then, uh, by their failure to be recognized, because one of them uh, is, uh, has become a slave, and so his recognition is invalid, etc., etc. Yeah. So, uh, in the end of the phenomenology, or, or maybe before the religion, we have something like a recognition, and then we have norms, yeah. in a way. It, um, I had the feeling you are, in a way, presupposing norms, and, um, which makes the things a little bit easier, I would say, for um, for our reading of Hegel, which you had only one hour. And uh, the other thing is that um, maybe when setting, putting this in this way, we would be more fair to Foucault and uh, to say and saying, okay, maybe you failed in showing us how norms come up. But, well, they were trying to do that, I think, on the other hand. <laughs> but I, I take it, though, that part of the problem with Foucault and Althusser, there's, I guess, two issues, is that, one, I would say, they already are operating within a normative framework, and that's part of the problem, is that they're giving accounts that they take to be true, that they take ought to be taken to be true by anyone. And so in that sense, there's already a contradiction on that level, and they can't account for the intelligibility of their own accounts. The second point, though, would also be that uh, uh, with respect to the contingent emergence of norms, in Foucault, for example, it's a little bit different in the case of Althusser, but Foucault takes these really to be competing accounts. Because he really wants to say that all reasons are rationalizations. They're illusory. They're not really true. That's why he says that he's not interested in the ideas we have about how we act. He's just interested in how we act. Whereas Hegel would say that the reasons we give are partly constitutive of what we do. So that's, that's yeah, I guess that's the, and all to say, I think, you know, he wants to allow for, you know, meaning and rationality to arise. But at the same time, he wants to say that, well, you know, uh, the only real order of explanation for history is the idea of the atomistic swerve. And even within a political situation, you know, what takes primacy is contingency. But it's not really about, you know, what we're committed to or, you know, who we take ourselves to be or what we ought to do. You know, it's really about uh, the contingent accumulation of contradictions, as he puts it. And with respect to him, I mean, I would just want to know, you know, what is a contradiction? What does he mean by contradiction? Because for Hegel, you know, for a contradiction to be a contradiction, it has to have normative content already. And that's just something that, you know, uh, it's not just that Althusser doesn't give us an account of that, but it's also that he takes his account to be inimical to that form of explanation at a certain level. Am I allowed to, to also intervene on the coordinating the discussion? I would like to raise the question of uh, Marxism also. 
because uh, during your lecture, um, what you were describing uh, as um, Foucault, it uh, rings a bell. It was as if you were describing Marxism in a sense, because for Marxism, history is a history of class struggle, and it's a history of uh, class domination. Yeah. It's the history of unfreedom. <coughs> and um, it appears as if Foucault is materialist in this kind of way, that history is just a product of uh, domination as you described it, etc. So I, I want to try to um, discern how you imagine, how we discern uh, Marxism, Marx and Marxism, uh, from Althusser or Foucault, for example, Adorno. Yeah. I, I would uh, try to approach this problem through um, the way um, Althusser uh, interpreted the Russian Revolution. He had a very narrow nationalist perspective. He said that the theory uh, was claiming that where the productive forces were more developed, revolution would come. That was Marx's speculation. Yeah. And revolution then happened to Russia, the more undeveloped country. Hence, he thought that the contingency over determination was yeah. proven in a practice. And uh, Marxists, Marxists were trying, like Kautsky, were trying to restrain them from revolution. Hence, uh, bourgeois subjectivity was trying to undermine anti-bourgeois subjectivity, so to speak. Um, so, um, I think we need to try to account for why to serve Foucault, uh, the Frankfurt School, um, appear as anti hegelian but there are different uh, forms of appearance of these problems. Uh, for example, the way I understand Marxism, uh, Lenin was not anti-bourgeois, but was bourgeois par excellence. Marx is saying in his uh, text on the Paris Commune that the Paris Commune was the first social form to realize private property. But that means that socialism constitutes capital and only in this way um, tries to overcome it. Mm -hmm. But this involves a risk, a danger. Hence this normativity of freedom, that we are already free, means that we are already reconstituting capital and domination. And this explains why um, anti-Hegelianism takes place in the 20th century but I think Adorno is a different case because it tries to uh, sustain bourgeois consciousness yeah. in its struggle for self-transformation, not through dualism of bourgeois and uh, socialist, etc. Right. Right. Okay, that was complicated, but I hope you got a bit my perspective. Yeah, I'm not sure I have anything to add to that now. Okay, uh, <laughs> it was just a... I agree. Okay. Uh, and then... Thank you. Uh, I have two questions, and the third one which you, I think, dismissed in your talk. Uh, first, in your title you mentioned Hegel's materialism. Yeah. But uh, it wasn't very clear to me, despite the radicalization of Kant, where do you see this materialism? Sure. Of course, you, you divided your talk and left Hegel to talk about modern theory, French theory, and so on. So perhaps you don't have the time, but do you, you mentioned something about contingency playing a role in the talk of lessons, of course. I mean, do you see it there, uh, or do you see it in necessity, for example? Uh, yeah. Like in Plato's theme, yeah. Yeah. you yeah. struggle with necessity, with matter, let's say. Um, this is the first question. And the second question is, Linked, of course, to the first. Which view of teleology is this that you mentioned that is found in Hegel in this way and makes history a process towards freedom? Uh, I think to, to, to preempt the answer, because it's not the question, where Heidegger comes in. Because the, the French, you mentioned the, the, the historical aspect that they may have not even read Hegel. But Heidegger, or Hegel for Heidegger, it's true, we know they did have, you know, they, they, they have read Heidegger and his critique of Hegel. Yeah. So this question of theology is also linked to this. I would like your opinion. Sure. And you can mention the third question. The, the third one was about Heidegger, but I see, I saw while reading it that it's linked to Aristotle's theology. 
Okay, yeah. <laughs> so the most kind of here does have a little virus that just keeps on asking. Yeah, I mean, I, this is probably a controversial thought, but I think that um, you know Heidegger and Hegel are both committed to very similar programs. Uh, that they're both trying to synthesize Kant and Aristotle uh, in similar ways. Um, I think Heidegger's the more problematic synthesis, synthesis of the, the two. Uh, so the first, the, the two questions are, are sort of connected. Um, I didn't really talk about the materialism point today because I'm going to talk about it more tomorrow. Um, and this was, you know, I sort of raised this in responding to uh, Richard's talk because I think that, that Hegel's materialism uh, really has to do with the category of life in the logic and, you know, his idea that living beings are beings that have to maintain their material substrate that they're dependent on, on matter, uh, but they're also more than matter. So I think that's essential. Uh, and Hegel is very explicit, and this is where the Aristotelian component comes in, um, he's very explicit in the logic that um, one of Kant's greatest insights in the third critique was his return to Aristotle's notion of inner purposiveness in the, the metaphysics and the physics. Um, and Hegel thinks that this idea of inner purposiveness, it is the concept. That's what he says. That this just is the the grid, you know. Uh, that the idea of a being that is a purpose unto itself, that has a purposive form, that's self-maintaining, that's self-constituting, um, that that Aristotelian notion, uh, you know, that that is the highest order of explanation for Hegel. Um, that's the highest form of rationality. So he already sees living beings as um, you know, a proto form of rational agents. You know, so non rational animals are for Hegel, you know, they're already free in a minimal sense. They are self determining, they lead their lives, they're self maintaining, self constituting, etc. Uh, I think that part of what Hegel is doing is he's taking this, this um, Aristotelian idea of inner purposiveness and giving it a historical inflection by saying that. Um, spirit is uh, the collective form of such, of such self-maintenance. You know, that we are collectively dependent on a material substrate. We have to labor to keep ourselves alive. You know, we give one another reasons for why we labor as we do, why we sustain the institutions that we do. We try to justify the ways in which we maintain our lives. So Hegel's giving sort of a, a rational and historical inflection to the idea of the inner purposiveness of, you know, living beings. Or another way to put it, when Aristotle says that virtue is the, the form function of, you know, rational agents, uh, that, you know, it's, uh, it's constitutive of the kinds of beings that we are, you know, that we are striving for the good, um, you know, in more or less sufficient ways. Hegel wants to say that uh, every form of spiritual life is an attempt to maintain itself as a spiritual life. And it's the failure of a spiritual life to so maintain itself that results in these historical breakdowns, you know, uh, mass social transformations, and you know, retrospective justifications of why we take ourselves uh, to be more justified in doing what we're doing than those who came before us. What Hegel wants to say is that this idea of a historically self-determining spirit, and this is really the point that I'm making tomorrow, he wants to say that unlike other living beings, so for a wolf, you know, what it means to be a wolf is, is set, it's determined. You know, wolves have a certain set of instinctual practices that they follow. They do the same things throughout their lives. You know, they are biologically oriented responses that are hardwired in a way. But Hegel also still wants to understand them as purposive. You know, a wolf has a reason, you know, uh, you know, to hunt a smaller animal. When it sees a smaller animal, it takes itself to have a reason for pursuing it. You know, this isn't just, it's not just cause to do that, you know, it's acting purposively, it's acting with a purpose. For us, Hegel thinks that our genus, 
unlike the case of a wolf, he thinks that our genus is free. That we have to determine what it would mean to truly lead a free life. That that can't be decided in advance in the way that it can for non rational animals. And so history is a progressive realization. Not guaranteed, it can fail, and Hegel thinks that it's totally contingent that this arose in the first place. But he thinks that, uh, yeah, that, that in a sense, like we can give an account of ourselves as having gotten better at doing this. And you know, we're slowly developing, or have slowly developed, uh, the content of what it would mean to lead a free life. What kinds of institutions we have to have. You know, what kind of state we have to have. We know what doesn't work. This sort of thing. I mean, there's all sorts of problems with his picture of that, but that's the logical claim, at least. And is that does that answer part of the question, or? Well, uh, yes, it does, of course. Uh, in the course of life, he's a book in the end of the logic exactly to, to I think as well to support this book. Uh, well, I mean, it seems to me again, going back to what we were talking about before, that, that one of the differences with Marx and Hegel, one of the differences with Marx and Hegel in terms of life is that Marx has a Darwinian conception of life emerging somehow from non life and the development of different forms. Can I say two things about that? Yeah. First, I don't think that Darwin's conception of natural selection as, is at all incompatible with the point that Hegel is making about life. I think that they're entirely compatible accounts. Hegel's not interested in you know, how the species of elephants emerged. He's interested in what it means to take an elephant as an elephant. He's interested in what it means to have that purposive life form. So it's, but, it's, but we can say that it, it but, contingently emerged through the process of natural selection. That's fine. But we're trying but to account for its but form. But again, getting back to the discussion of contingency, so you made a comment in passing also about like people taking norms and societies taking norms of some kind of thing. And that, that like ancient and feudal society that a norm fed, right? But again, th there is like from another perspective of seeing history, you could say, well, like, did ancient democracy fail because some kind of norm or idea of society failed or was it due to contingent material forces, right? And similarly, when you talk about contingency and, and necessity, there are two types of contingency, right? There are things that are individually contingent, but cumulatively become more and more probable, right? There are things that are not necessary, but highly likely. And there are also things that if something happens, the entire subsequent course of history Absolutely. I completely agree that we have to make that sort of distinction. And when we make the sort of distinction, when we say that, I mean, Hegel, for instance, wants to give an account of the necessary failure of the Greek polis, for example. He thinks that there are good reasons as to why it failed. It wasn't just a contingent natural disaster. There are other forms of life that did fail for contingent natural reasons or, you know, for whatever, whatever they were sapped or whatever other contingencies. But Hegel's point, you know, uh, is there's always a normative, a normative judgment that we're making about the past. And of course, we can be wrong about, you know, it could come out later that, you know, Hegel is wrong in his account of why the poll has failed, and we need to revise our account of what happened. But it's always a practical proposal. How we're understanding the past, that itself is a normative proposal. It's not exempt from the provisionality that attends any normative judgment. The distinction that you're making, though, between different orders of explanation, you know, between efficient causes and, and final causes, uh, Hegel says, yes, that's absolutely necessary. That's necessary for the intelligibility of history, for reality. Uh, but when we're giving an account of the, the history of spirit, you know, of what it means for spirit to actually be spirit, for it to succeed at being spirit, you know, it's not that we're excluding it's not that we're excluding contingency, but we're also asking the question of what do we count as a failure? What do we count as a success? What do we count as a greater form of success? What do we count as a better reason than past reasons? Right, and part of the difficulty with Hegel is also dealing with the problem of regression and historical failure. I mean, it's one thing to say, well, the polis failed necessarily, or, you know, the, the European Middle Ages had this. But then if you say, well, what, what about the Russian Revolution or the German Revolution, right? But that's where the question of necessity 
and rationality of history, I think, comes to the fore in terms of there's an optimism, a basic optimism to Hegel's perspective. And the 20th century shattered a lot of that optimism about history. Yeah, Hegel was optimistic because he had historical reasons to the, believe yeah, that such o- optimism, optimism was worthwhile. But I don't think that logically that his position entails such optimism. I think it, Hegel's position is the only way that you could actually render such regression intelligible. Uh, here we go. Yes, I would like to underline uh, again one it's a small thing. Um, I, I understand what you are trying to, I think I understand what you are trying to make out of Hegel. And I, I sympathize with the way you read him, but I think it is, there are two things we should always distinguish what he said and what he ought to have said. I mean, of, of course, uh, of course. According to us. Maybe we're right about saying that. For example, he did say something about Lamarck and evolutionism, and he was again. I agree that we can think with tools from Hegel and Darwin together without problem, but this is not his idea. Sure, sure, <laughs> sure. I mean, uh, this. Second, second. Okay, yeah. We can interpret its judgment as being normative, but he has spoken of normative judgments. And he didn't say it's the best way to interpret any judgments. He said syllogisms are better than judgments. Okay, for example. Or we say we can say what he is considering as concept is what we thought ought to be real rather than what is real. But on the other hand, we have a critique of the concept of zonen, which means what ought to be, and a very sharp critique of this concept in Hegel's law. So, okay, okay, it's, it's a way we should distinguish how we read someone and how he would comment on his own. Okay, uh, so just that. Okay, yeah, <laughs> just to make a provision on distinction, I, I'll say this explicitly tomorrow. I should have said it today, but. Uh, yeah, so this is definitely a day ray rather than a day dicto reading of Hegel. I'm less concerned, it is important, but I'm less concerned with what Hegel himself has to say than with the matter itself, than what you know Hegel ought to be saying. Okay. So that's <laughs> that's the uh, first. But I also think that there are good reasons, you know, to think that a lot of this is what Hegel is, you know, trying to say. So, but aside from that, the second question. Um, uh, the, the Zolan issue. Uh, yeah, so for instance, just to give an example, when I am using the language of ought, we take a, a, you know, a wolf again, a wolf with a broken leg. A wolf ought not to have a broken leg. There's a way that that's a, it's a deficiency. It ought not to have a broken leg. That marks, uh, there's a discrepancy between, you know, uh, what a wolf ought to be and what it is in that instance. And that's a constitutive ought. It's not external. When I say that a wolf ought not have a broken leg, I'm not imposing an external ideal on the wolf. I'm saying what wolves, by their own lights, ought to be. So when I use ought in this sense, I'm using it in this constitutive internalist sense. This is precisely Hegel's critique of Kant. At the end of the logic, you know, he, Hegel's, it's probably too much to go into right now, but he, he wants to say that, you know, uh, Kant basically held this sort of externalist view that, uh, you know, in a very sophisticated way, that, that the categorical imperative ultimately ends up being a kind of external thought, given that, you know, we are intrinsically fallen, desiring, natural animals. We're radically evil. We'll always be predisposed uh, to granting primacy to self-love over respect for the moral law. Hegel thought that, you know, that, that you know, any commitment that Kant could then have to the highest good, to, you know, the moral law, that all of it was uh, tainted because, you know, this basically meant that we could never be moral, that there would always be skeptical doubts about, you know, whether there was any reason to think that we ought to be moral. That there would always be skeptical doubts, you know, about whether or not the highest good um, actually pertains to us or should pertain to us. So Hegel wants to say that, you know, uh, that the ought with respect to spirit, that, it's, that the polis is trying to be the polis, it's trying to do what the polis ought to do, 
not what some external ideal demands of the polis. Bourgeois society is trying to be bourgeois society, you know, and it can't do that by its own lights. That's why it fails. That's that's the claim. So it's not a it's not an external opt like the Kantian opt. It's it's a constitutive one. That's a little bit unfair to Kant because that's not what Kant wants to say, but that's what Hegel says that Kant ultimately does say, whether he wants to or not. I'm going to ask that after. We have uh, got a hand on if there are any questions, interventions. Um, I, I would like to ask the uh, second question. Uh, Hegel in uh, the lesser logic, he's saying that uh, for philosophy in the beginning, uh, to be engaged with philosophy, you need uh, a basic familiarity with each object. For example, if you are really feeling you have a certain familiarity with this object. And then you need the motivation. You need uh, to have an interest. So, um, what is the interest that leads us to, what is the need that leads us to philosophy? Because it is a product of class society, and one is suspicious that the need to philosophize is the need to present a unity in a rather fractured world, uh, you know, destroyed by class domination and uh, divisions. Yeah. So I, I was wondering if uh, Althusser go are uh, dystopian uh, versions of the struggle to overcome the need for philosophy, like they are prematurely trying to overcome the need. Um, but we have to take the need seriously yeah. because uh, we have not moved beyond the society that motivates us to, in the first place, yeah. deal with uh, philosophy. I want to make it a bit more practical, um, political in itself. It's as if the world is free prematurely for us to say that uh, in an instant freedom may rise yeah. because we try a different encounter. Yeah. But you have to take seriously capital as a form of disintegration or a restraint, a form of restraint, even in the deepest subjectivity. Yeah. I want to make it a bit more uh, the important of this whole discussion for uh, politics in the 20th century, etc. Uh, I don't know if you want to answer because the meeting also want to raise a concern. So perhaps you can listen also to the meeting okay. then yeah. if you want to address. Yeah, so to put the issue of politics, I was trying to see the political relevance of your speech since you started talking about Jacobin and the Cortes and the Grecs. So even though I'm not well versed in Hegel, I was trying to find out what's the connection between your talk about the, the, the consistency in Hegel's thought about how he set standards about logic and how we somehow judge ourselves against it. Yeah. In, in contradistinction to Foucault and Dalbusser, who seem to go from worse to worse. Yeah. Uh, so, pretty much, was that a critique of Webster's so called critical theory and its limitations? And that's pretty interesting, in my opinion. And uh, also, this could piggyback very well with Richard Scott earlier this afternoon. And uh, coming from a background of social sciences, I would also call for a historicization of our to go. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah. The period where they, when they emerged, when there was an actual socialist project yeah. taking place somewhere else that set its own standards right. and, for better or worse, tried to deliver. Yeah. yeah. That's my comment. Yeah, I would just say that I, I see as the. Um, <coughs> Uh, yeah, this question of the relationship between philosophy and politics is, is within Platypus. It's been the ongoing issue. Uh, yeah, what, what does it really mean to return to Hegel's logic today? Why does that, uh, why does that matter? Um, I think part of it has to do with, you know, I think it, philosophical positions 
uh, constitute fields of vision, that they make certain things in our political environment appear or show up as salient and other things as less salient. And so like I said at the end of Richard's talk, you know, I, I don't subscribe to any sort of causal relationship between philosophical and political position. You know, I don't think that having the right philosophical position will, you know, of necessity lead to the right political position or vice versa. Uh, but it's a point of orientation that's always there, whether you know that it's there or not. You're always subscribing to some conception of how reality ought to be understood. That's always implicit in any form of politics, and it's going to affect the kind of politics you think that change requires. I mean, for someone like Foucault, who rejects, you know, adamantly rejects the idea that there is any sort of social totality, that there is any sort of we at all, that there is any notion of overarching institutional change that's required, but that it rather consists in, you know, what he calls the change that specific intellectuals can affect within concrete institutional contexts, and that's what we should limit ourselves to. So it becomes a sort of reformist politics or, you know, uh, yeah, sort of, a sort of reformism or, uh, you know, anarchism. You know, his position doesn't necessarily entail those political ideas, but one can see how uh, it would be conducive to, you know, those political fields of possibility and, and those, you know, visions of what would constitute effective change, effective political action. So, and I think Teo mentioned earlier that, uh, yeah, that there's always, you know, there's always Althusser and Foucault themselves, you know, and Althusser in particular was adamant that philosophy has a very specific political task within the realm of philosophy. It's fighting the political struggle in the realm of ideology. I disagree with the way that he understands the relationship between ideology and politics, but I think that he's right to say that, you know, philosophy is sort of a self reflexive form of ideology. You know, it is a way of interrogating, you know, what we believe and the reasons that we give for why we believe what we do. Uh, and why we believe what we do inflects, you know, what we believe we ought to do. So that's why I think that, that these sort of, that, that, that the philosophical question of how we ought to understand ourselves uh, is a necessary but not sufficient question to raise, you know, in pursuing any sort of emancipatory politics. I guess that's, yeah. I mean, to go back, to, I have a question about historicization. I mean, it seems to me all of, well, not Hegel, right, but just as Hegel was responding to the era of the French Revolution and the particular politics of Europe and, and Napoleon, the, the, obviously, Althusser and Foucault are particularly responding to the experience of the French Communist Party. Absolutely. It's, like, it's a yeah. very concrete, and, and it's and, in opposed directions, yeah. And in opposed directions, yeah. and like the whole aleatory materialism, and cynically, my thought is well, this is just a way of saying, well, you know, who knows? Maybe there'll be a revolution tomorrow because, like, the atoms will just bang into each other. Well, that was, he took that to be his critique of Stalinism. I mean, that's what he was trying to articulate. But that's, it's actually like the opposite. It's really like. No, of course. I mean, that, the pure contingency becomes pure determinism. I mean, he ultimately ends up in a very, you know, similar uh, position conceptually. But yeah, and, and part of their, my, my account isn't meant to compete with symptomatic accounts of Althusser and Foucault or historical accounts, you know, that would try to grasp the conditions for the possibility of their thinking. But I just don't think that those sorts of symptomatic accounts are sufficient to account for what's going wrong in their thinking, why we should reject it. That's, that's the point, is that, that there are, you know, any critique that one would offer of Althusser and Foucault, that there are philosophical presuppositions in that critique. Uh, and I think the only way to adequately address them is by way of the resources that Hegel gives us. <laughs>